Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court, Jeremy Bailey on behalf of New Hope Ministries. May I reserve the five minutes for yes, uh, for rebuttal? Thank you. The crux of the issue in this case is whether the church's lawsuit was prematurely filed when it filed suit for insurance policy benefits it was owed for property damage the church sustained during Hurricane Irma. The trial court entered final judgment in favor of the insurance company, finding the lawsuit was premature based on one specific finding, that a supplemental claim was needed to be filed as a condition precedent to filing suit, and that no supplemental claim was filed in this case. But the court went further than just saying a supplemental claim needed to be filed. It held that in order for the, uh, the, the church to file a supplemental claim, it couldn't just disagree with the loss by the carrier. It had to submit a written detailed analysis of the loss, with an actual itemized damage of the property, including the actual cost to repair or replace the damage. Let me ask you this. The Goldberg case, I know the trial court found that it was all on fours. What is your position? Is the Goldberg case right on point with the facts of this case, or is it a little bit distinguishable from this uh, case? Sure. I would say two points to that, Your Honor. The first is that it is distinguishable on a very critical ground. And we also made the argument in our briefs that the, the Goldberg case is respectfully, I think, a misinterpretation of that policy provision. But, but first, on the critical distinction as to why it's distinguishable, in Goldberg, the court pointed to a similar supplemental claim provision. And, 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 and when we're talking about a supplemental claim provision, there is no provision in the policy that says you must submit a supplemental claim, right? It's just a definition of what a supplemental claim is. And the court said that in the loss against us provision, of the policy, that it incorporated the definition of supplemental claim to mean that if you if you want to seek extra policy benefits, and in that case, it seems that the court suggested even requesting a dollar more than the carrier initially agreed with, that would be a supplemental claim that would have to be first submitted because of how it is incorporated into the loss against us provision. This policy is quite different. In the, in the action against us provision in this policy, it actually specifically excludes the supplemental uh, claim provision from application in that in that. Did you argue that below? Because I don't recall you arguing that below to the judge. The judge simply took issue with the fact that the notice of this claim was by. Now, trust us. The, the, the fact that this is a church, a church insurance company is not lost on us. We emphasize we empathize with the church, the extensive damage by Irma and everything else, but we are bound to, you know, interpret insurance contracts by the plain language. And the supplemental claim here includes a reopened claim. Are you disagreeing with the fact this is a reopened claim because you're claiming additional money for a roof? Now they paid you much less than what you're claiming, you're claiming over $2 million. So I don't recall the court ever saying you had to do any specific inventory or estimates, things like that. But I'll tell you, in the record, CMIC did, according to the duties in the event of loss or damage, did request inventories, damage content, estimates, photos, everything. Your client didn't respond with any paper at all. And Mr. Cook's testimony and his conclusions are based on the results of expert investigations that occurred long after your client was paid. He has lay opinions about what it requires. And that is information the insurance company was never given. So uh, your, your Honor raised, I think, two, two separate points, and I, I'd like to address them in turn. The first point was about whether or not the church presented a supplemental claim based on the terms of the policy. Correct, which and, we would agree orally you can do that. So in, in, in looking at the terms of the policy, which, which your honor noted, the, the terms of the policy say that it's, it's a supplemental claim is an additional claim that's filed that's separate and apart from the benefits in the, 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 the item sought in the initial claim, well, right? Well, that's not true because it includes reopened claims. But it's either supplemental or reopened is an, is an additional claim separate and apart from the initial claim. Right. Right. So why is this a reopened claim? So this, this court's opinion in Ironwood and in Veranda 
both speak to the idea of what does it mean to be separate and apart from the initial claim. Yeah, but in Ironwood, they filed a claim. This case, you didn't file a claim. In Ironwood, it's undisputed. Plus, the carrier agreed that the roof dispute was not at issue. Here, you don't. So that's clearly distinguishable. And also, the insured the issue of the insurance compliance with the post loss obligations was up to the trial court to decide. And that's what the court did here. Well, that to, to your point there, Your Honor, and that was the second point I was going to address. In order to find that the insured breached the policy and, and materially failed to comply with its duties under the policy, the trial court would also have to make a finding that there was prejudice to the insurance company. And there was no finding or even argument below that the insurance company was prejudiced by uh, the alleged failure to, to comply with a duty uh, under the policy before filing suit. Well, but they paid a certain amount that you absolutely agree, disagree with. It's substantially lower. And then you file a lawsuit for $2.6 million when they paid you pennies because of the deductible and everything else. How's that not prejudice? Why can't we find prejudice in this record? Two, two points on that, Your Honor. First, there, there have to be an opportunity to blow to plead the idea of prejudice and have an actual opportunity to discuss that point before the trial court. That was not even in the motion that was filed before the trial court. The, the only argument raised before the trial court was that Goldberg required a supplemental claim to be filed and that the, the church's disagreement with the, uh, the lost pre-suit was not a sufficient supplemental claim. And that's where the trial court stated that in order to submit a claim, it have to, quote, submit an oral or written claim of what was damaged or the cost of repair or replacement. That language is found nowhere in the policy. The trial court imposed an additional obligation on the insured to say, it's not just that you have to submit a supplemental claim or that you have to, uh, to, to tell the insurance company before you file a suit that you disagree with their analysis of the loss. You must specifically provide an itemization of, quote, what was damaged or the cost of repair or replacement. But the only thing the insurance company had in front of it was the initial claim. And afterwards, there was all sorts of things that went wrong between the church's representative and the, and the uh, insurer's representatives, none of which was really quantified in any way or communicated in any specific way. And that's part of the problem. If the idea, if, if the insurance company is going to be taken to task for breaching a contract, they have to at least then put on notice as to why they were breaching the contract. And while those conversations uh, were apparently many between the church representative and the insurance company's representative, there's no evidence before us that can allow us to say, okay, this is what they were asking for. And that's, that's the part of the problem. And the policy does require there to be some notice that the insurance company has this is what we need. This is our loss. This is what we're expecting you to do. Because if the insurance company needs that to be able to accept it or reject it, and in this case, they never got that. If the policy had said that in order to file suit against us because you disagree with our initial claim decision, you must submit a competing damages estimate, that, that would be absolutely correct. But the only thing the policy requires, if, if this court adopts the Goldberg line of, 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 of reasoning, is to submit a supplemental claim. And insured submit claims over the phone all the time, right? They call their insurance company and say, my property was damaged as a result of the storm. I don't think anybody has a problem with an oral claim, as Judge Sleet said. The difficulty we have with this record is it's hard for us to understand what the church's ultimate position was vis-a-vis -vis the insurance company. So the insurance company never really had an opportunity to say, you want $2 million? We're not paying $2 million. There was never... It was a bit and piece conversation between representatives of each place, never with a picture being painted as to say, this is what we need. These are our losses. This is what you need to pay us. It just, it, it was more in the nature of, we don't agree with the insurance company's adjuster. It was not, this is what our people are saying you need to get. I would, I would say two points to that, Your Honor. The, the first being that that there is no obligation in the policy to go out and, can, and create a competing damages estimate, nor would the church be the appropriate entity to, to, to impose, to, but, to but receive that to obligation. A claim based on something, right? Sure. And Mr. Coach's affidavit specifically states that he called the insurance company after he received the coverage analysis 
and said that the, the repainting of the event center roof was not going to be enough, that he was literally in the building when Hurricane Irma was striking and he saw pieces of the roof come off and that it needed either a structural engineer to come out and inspect it or a complete roof replacement. But and that was his opinion before they retained the experts and your client never informed CMIC that you retained experts. Plus, you have the legal obligation to comply with post loss obligations in the property conditions, duties and event of loss and damage. Uh, subparagraph five, at our request, and it says in the preceding paragraph, you must do this. At our request, give us complete inventories, damage and undamaged property, including quantities, costs, values, and amount of loss cost. Well, in September, uh, Ms. Rumlin or Ms. McDonald sent an email to your client specifically asking for that. Your client did nothing. Or if your client did, they responded by talking about the light bulb damage. That was it. That was it. We're not sitting here telling you that this court requires some sort of specific invoice itemized that you have to even go out and hire experts. The problem with this case is when the attorney sent his rep letter, he did not even inform CMIC of a dispute. You can't sit here and say, okay, I represent these people. So the CMC is supposed to have ESP and say, well, they're going to sue us. They must disagree with this. The lawyer need, never even told them what they disagreed with. Then they get Kelly roofing. Then they get SCI. But that's not until 2020, three years after this hurricane, that they come up with their opinions. Well, then they get sued in October of 2019. And then she sends, Ms. Ronlin sends a letter to the attorney. Why are you suing us? There's no documentation in the record that he responded to that. Respect, Your Honor, I would say that all goes to a separate defense raised by the carrier that, that wasn't addressed in this particular motion for summary judgment below, and that the, that the trial court didn't have the opportunity to review, nor the church have an opportunity to respond to, which is why the record is so bare as to what the church did in the pre-suit uh, uh, investigation of the claim. I think but, the judge called on the attorney and said, you made a phone call. There's nothing else in this record to show that you gave them any other documentation about cost, repair, or anything else. So the judge was on that and asked the attorney. As to the supplemental claim portion, Your Honor, I, the, the motion was limited to whether or not a supplemental claim was filed. And, and what was argued below and the focus of the argument was not whether there was some breach of the duties uh, of prior to filing the lawsuit. It was focused on whether or not there was a specific itemized damage estimate that was provided pre-suit. And that, the correct, that wasn't provided pre-suit, but there was also no obligation in the policy to provide that pre-suit. Well, let me ask you then, because that ties into all of that. Um, one of the issues, now, because I know you have a little bit of time and I want you to address this. Isn't also the policy that there is a you have to comply with the term of the policy that seeks replacement costs, that you were seeking replacement costs, value damages, but isn't a requirement you have to complete repairs. I want you to address that. The church hasn't undertaken any repairs in order to proceed with the request for replacement cost damages, because that's part and parcel of the whole thing that you're asking for. Sure. So, so if you could just uh, talk about that. You have about one minute left of the time. You have reserved five minutes. But sure. We'll be into that reservation time in one minute. Okay. So I'll, go, I'll, go, that I'll go quickly. Time. Your time. You can use two, you want. two points to that, Your Honor, very briefly. One would be that the church did perform some of the repairs. Mr. Coach's affidavit said that they spent about over $109,000 doing the HVAC repairs, which was a part of the covered loss, and they repaired the, uh, the carpet in the church building that, that sustained damage. But two, one of the primary arguments that we made in this point was that final judgment in favor of the insurance company is not supported by any of the case law cited by the insurance company at this point. Potentially a partial summary judgment saying they're not entitled to a final judgment in their favor mandating payment, but there's certainly the case law suggests that when you have uh, uh, contracts and to uh, uh, incur the costs and that you've begun replacement of the, of the damage like the church has done with the HVAC and the carpet, Final judgment isn't isn't appropriate. Potentially partial summary judgment, but not but not final judgment in their favor, which dovetails back into one of the primary points we raised too in in the in, in uh, 
in our initial brief was that even if the lawsuit was premature and that there was some condition precedent that the uh, that the insurer was supposed to comply with, right? The, the, the policy doesn't say you have to go out and create estimates if you if you if you don't have them, right? If you have them, you you have to provide them. But if there was some condition precedent they didn't comply with, final judgment isn't the correct result. It's court and Curtis and Skeen and Iwaniki have said that the the correct result is abatement, potentially. To give the to give the carrier that opportunity to make an updated coverage decision, but not final judgment in their favor. And I'll reserve the remainder of my time. Okay. Thank you. You've got four and a half minutes. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Dina Sacro, and I represent the Apelli Church Mutual Insurance Company. First question: Goldberg is yes. Goldberg ground point. Your Honor, Goldberg is directly applicable, persuasive, and identical to the situation that we have before us. It's identical factually and in terms of the policy provision. The facts in Goldberg were the insured made a Hurricane Irma claim. Church Mutual received a Hurricane Irma claim with respect to the plaintiff. The carrier an analyzed the case, made a payment and acknowledgement of coverage based on its own determination, received a phone call from the insured claiming that there, they had an estimate that was higher than what the carrier paid, but never gave the estimate, never provided a document, never submitted a letter with a demand, and just filed a lawsuit. The exact same situation and fact pattern is what exists here. The interpretation of the policy provision at play is also the exact same provision at issue in this case. But your opposing counsel, you've heard, said that nowhere in the policy does it say we have to quantify this loss in some way. Well, Your Honor, we would respectfully disagree. The notice provision that applies to hurricanes, and this particular provision specifically applies to hurricanes, says notice of a claim, supplemental claim, or reported claim, or reopened claim, excuse me. Does it must matter what this is? Your, reopen, does it matter? Our position, Your Honor, would be no, it does not matter. If the policy was not intended to require notice of a supplemental claim or a reopen claim, it wouldn't include that language in the policy. Policies need to be interpreted based on all of the provisions that are there. They're not meant to be interpreted in a way that would render a provision meaningless. And that is exactly what opposing counsel is attempting to do. They're attempting to overlook the fact that the policy requires notice of a claim, supplemental claim, or a reopened claim to be submitted. What about all these conversations that were had between the church's representative and the insurance companies? The two ladies that were represented with a whole lot of back and forth. I mean, isn't it reasonable to sort of say we could get some sort of claim out of that dialogue? Your Honor, our position is that it would not be reasonable. It's not enough to just simply say somebody else needs to do something or we don't agree with this. Carrier would need to be put on notice of what the dispute is. That's just like, Your Honor, we're questioning opposing counsel. That's so, the so, issue that exists here. So policyholders don't have to go out and hire their own adjusters and, and, and produce a formalized, you know, detailed claim of these damages. Is that what they should have done? Well, your Honor, if, a, if an insurer does, disagrees with the number or whatever the assessment when there's an acknowledged claim, there would have to be some indication from their perspective of what the cost would be to determine that that number was insufficient. In the Goldberg case, the Goldberg decision was based on three independent rulings. The first was analyzing supplemental claim and the definition in the context of the policy. The second one was the provision, just like our case, in the policy that says no action um, can be pursued unless there's been full compliance with the terms of the policy. The legal action against us provision in the church mutual policy also contains the requirement of full compliance with the terms of the policy before you can file a suit. The third decision made by the Goldberg in the Goldberg ruling was just the most basic concept, which is a breach cannot occur unless the carrier has received a competing damage estimate or something that, as your honor previously suggested to opposing counsel, there's notice of what is being claimed so the carrier can make a conscious decision of whether it agrees or disagrees Goldberg with the position the insurer is distinguishable because Goldberg was a roof claim that was resolved. Then there were windows and doors. That's the supplemental claim. It's a little clear, more clear in Goldberg than it is here. No doubt this church suffered some severe, substantial roof damage. Doesn't sound to me that you're contesting their initial claim. Phone call, Mr. Cope coming, talking to these people. I think you agree, and there's precedent in, in the favor of that's notice. That's notice. I think what you're what you're talking about is you adjusted the claim. 
you pay and nobody ever disagreed until you got the lawsuit because the letter didn't even agree, disagree with you. You weren't even informed of that. So let's use that, that landscape. This could be a reopened claim about the roof. And they've argued that Ironwood says if the roof is resolved, and that's fine. And they're arguing that your last payment and the, and the letter said, this is a final payment. They disagree with, and they have a right to sue. Address that. Yes, Your Honor. So first, um, the Goldberg decision doesn't address the distinction between roofs or um, interior damage. It doesn't analyze any difference of what was being claimed because in the Goldberg case, there was none, but in Ironwood, they did. But the distinguishing factor in Ironwood is the opinion is based on whether or not the insurer is required to proceed with appraisal. And in order to go forward with appraisal, there has to be a coverage determination as to what's being claimed. There needs to be a determination of compliance with the terms of the policy. And the big factor that exists and distinguishes Ironwood from the facts here is Ironwood only exists because the insured did give additional information to the insurance carrier. The insurance carrier received documentation regarding what was being claimed or a new scope of what was being claimed. It's the absence of that information here that creates a, a distinguishing from, that creates the case being comparable to Goldberg as comparable to Ironwood. Okay, so let's segue to duties after loss. I mean, the CMIC representative clearly sent a letter saying, give us this. And then under your duties after loss provisions, they must do that. Yes, Your Honor, that is my understanding from reading this. They didn't at all. Yes, Your Honor, but correct. Your opposing counsel is saying that wasn't raised below. It well, seems to me you tiptoed around it below. And the judge picked up on it and said you didn't do anything else. It was raised your, below, Your Honor, in the context of non-compliance with terms of the policy. In the provision and the argument raised regarding legal action against us provision of the policy, which required full compliance with the policy, that's the context where the duties against loss provision became, was addressed in the underlying motion for summary judgment, Your Honor. The position was legal action, legal action against us provision requires compliance with the policy. And there was no compliance on two grounds. First, non-compliance was submitting a notice of a supplemental or a reopens claim. And second, failure to provide any of the documentation that had been specifically requested by the carrier, that being the HVAC damages, which opposing counsel specifically just mentioned was approximately $100,000 of the claim being made in litigation and any estimates, photographs, or other documentation. We also raised that the complaint asserted by plaintiff, by the appellant, sought mold related damages, but there had been no claim or information ever submitted to Church Mutual with respect to mold damages. And so and, and to kind of steer you back to one of the positions that they've taken in terms of and this is simply placing your carrier on notice of the supplemental claim. If this is a pre-suit requirement, how about abating the action? in order to gather all this information as opposed to outright granting summary judgment. How do you respond to that? The cases that the plaintiff is relying on with respect to abatement or staying are sinkhole cases. The Skeen case, the Curtis case, those are sinkhole claims. And in the context of sinkhole, Florida has a specific statute that addresses neutral evaluation. And in the neutral evaluation statute, there's a specific provision regarding stay of litigation during the course of the neutral evaluation. There is no comparable statute or, or anything that would exist in the context of Hurricane Irma claims, hurricane there claims no or the policy. At all that would address that. So why can't we go to the sinkhole statute and reason by analogy, which we, we lawyers in this room do every day? But the right. other the other problem, Your Honor, is attorney's fees, for instance. Florida statute 627.428, the attorney fee statute, is a statute that would is an enabling statute to provide coverage for attorney's fees where an insured files a claim against an insurer and recovers and prevails in a judgment, okay? And if this case were to proceed forward with an abatement and let's say there was no resolution in it where abatement was lifted and proceeded forward through trial, the issue of attorney's fees would become at issue when for the first 
X number of years of litigating this case, there was no justifiable basis for attorney's fees. The case law analyzing attorney's fees specifically states that the statute was created as a means to deter insurance companies from inappropriately denying claims. There needs to be a breakdown in the claims adjusting process in order to qualify for recovery of attorney's fees. That situation doesn't exist here and would affect and prejudice the carrier if an abatement was put in to allow a period of time for addressment, addressing a supplemental claim, and then simply reinitiating the litigation and proceeding forward. That, Your Honor, is one of the most primary, pr primarily prejudicial issues with respect to church mutual and staying or abating the case in the context of this claim. With respect to, are there any other questions with respect to the notice well, issue? Well, I think the remedy is probably concerning to Judge Guzman and to me and maybe Judge Sleep. You know, so, so the choices here that the trial court had was to grant summary judgment, in other words, judgment in favor of the insurance company, case over jeopardy attaches, right? Or to dismiss the case without prejudice because it was premature, or to stay the case as Judge Kuzan suggests. So uh, the three years have run since the event. So there's no ability because there's three years they have to have made a claim from the time that Hurricane made landfall, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And that three years has run, correct? Correct, correct Your Honor. Okay. So the only remedy that we have before us either is to affirm the summary judgment or to reverse the summary judgment. We can't even remand sensibly to stay or to dismiss. Is that right? It's time for us. Your Honor, the time has run, but counsel, uh, the appellant has not raised that issue in any of its briefing. Well, I, Did, I didn't invent it out of my head. I got it from something or other. There, there is there the initial brief that's been filed by the plaintiff does not raise any issue with respect to prejudice or the three year time period having run. A failure to include an argument in an initial brief waives that and abandons that issue. In our answer brief, we cited case law supporting that proposition. Are that, you also arguing that the issue of whether this is a partial summary judgment rather than a final summary judgment wasn't raised in brief? Yes, Your Honor. That, that you, was. You agree with that? Yes, I would agree with you, yeah, well, Your Honor. Because I recall reading the transcript, one issue was raised below by the appellate was, let's send this to jury trial and let's deal with the RCB in a post-trial motion, kind of like collateral sources in a personal injury case. Sure. So to address that issue, Your Honor, it. it the insured has never made an ACV claim. The undisputed record evidence exists that the only claim ever being pursued was a replacement cost value claim. That position may have some merit if the insured had made an actual cash value claim and a replacement cost value claim and was acknowledging that they would they were seeking actual cash value. That is absent in the record that exists here. The undisputed record evidence is the only damage estimates in the litigation that were being relied on were replacement cost value estimates. That the testimony of the insured's corporate representative only testified they were seeking the full replacement cost value of the claim. And there was no affirmative statement in the litigation or obviously prior to the litigation that the insured was seeking actual cash value and upon completion of repairs, replacement cost value. So the notion of saving this issue for post-verdict issues has been arguably not waived and not addressed by plaintiff or in the underlying case or appellant in the initial brief to, in that regard. Plaintiff, the appellant has not in any way stated that they had indicated they were making an actual cash value claim. They've only ever supported the replacement cost value. And we've identified two 11th Circuit cases that specifically have comparable facts to the replacement cost value issue. The insured or the insured's assignee only submitted claims for replacement cost value. The evidence and testimony through discovery was they were only seeking replacement cost value. And those policies had the exact same language and are in the church mutual policy. The unless and until replacement cost value is not recoverable unless repairs have been completed and until repairs have been completed and unless those repairs were completed within a reasonable time after the loss. Those provisions and the analysis by the 11th Circuit were full and final summary judgment on the replacement cost value issues, full and final summary judgment finding that the carrier could not have breached the contract to pay replacement cost value when the repairs had not been completed, and the insured could not have breached the policy seeking actual cash value when no claim for actual cash value had been asserted. So those were full and complete summary judgments. With respect to the, the Goldberg issue, Gold, the notice issue and partial summary versus full summary judgment, the Goldberg decision was a full and complete summary judgment provision. The provision specifically in that, the ruling in that case also said 
you have leave to make a supplemental claim. In that case, it was issued September 9th, 2020, the day before three years would have run with respect to the, the three-year time period from Hurricane Irma. It provided that option and leave. Church Mutual and the record evidence exists that Church Mutual's position of the failure to submit notice of a claim was being made as soon as one week or one month after the lawsuit had been served in 2019. The, a summary judgment had been filed before Goldberg had been released on that issue. And the, carry, the appellant in this case never took any steps at that point in time to try to stay or litigate or do anything to within the three-year time period that they had submit, dismiss the case, submit notice of a supplemental claim and refile it. To the extent they're now, or the court is now analyzing whether or not the ruling in this case should be affirmed because the affirmance would result in arguably potential prejudice for failure to comply with three years. That has not been raised by the initial brief and the appellant has waived that issue. And that does not prevent your honor from, from affirming the trial court's determination, which was legally sound at the time it was made. And as an aside, the insured has filed a second lawsuit against Church Mutual that is pending right now in the appellate court. So, I mean, in the state court system, attempting to assert that a supplemental claim had been submitted. So to the extent your honor is concerned about prejudice, the insured has already at this point attempted to make that claim. The appellant has also cited to the Chavez case and the Chavez case also granted full summary judgment with leave to provide supplemental notice of a claim. So that's a second decision that was relied on by the appellant that supports that specific role in your honor. Does the court have any other additional questions? In a nutshell, what you're basically saying that they were aware of what other extensive damages and they were well within the three year period to provide you with the source of the supplemental claim and they failed to do it. Yes, your honor. Because they failed to do it. Yes, Your Honor. For, for that, yes, Your Honor, that's exactly that. There had been, a, as, as um, Judge Sleep previously mentioned, the carrier's representative, when the lawyer provided notice of representation, specifically reached out and said, I don't know why you've been retained. We've heard nothing. What's going on? And asked for a response, left a message that I haven't heard back and nothing was ever received. And there's nothing in the record of, in the record below that says any response by the insured, any representative of the insured or by counsel for the insured that would have gotten back to the carrier. So for those reasons, the fact pattern is identical to Goldberg. And because the insurer three months, almost a, yeah, a year and three months at that point in time. And the lawyer could have submitted additional information and documentation on behalf of the insured and still didn't do it. And then in October of 2019, when the lawsuit was filed, the record evidence shows communications from my office to counsel for the plaintiff, specifically stating we, have, we haven't received any information or documentation or a supplemental claim. And still nothing was taken. And the, the course and action by the appellant was to continue litigating the case. Now Goldberg's been released. Goldberg is persuasive. It is sound. It is identical to the facts of this case. For that reason, the motion for summary judgment entered with respect to the supplemental notice motion should be grant, should be affirmed. And independently, the replacement cost value, there are two independent motions for summary judgment. They're independent grounds to support this. Even a rejection or, or reversal of one um, and acceptance of the other would still support the complete entry of summary judgment in this case, because they're both independent grounds that support affirming the trial court's decision. But Goldberg, of course, is from the fourth DCA, not from the second, so it's not mandatory for us. It's only persuasive, so we have the option of either agreeing or disagreeing, right? Correct, Your Honor. As it exists right now, no, no district court has disagreed with Goldberg, but this court has seemingly adopted it, at least in the Ironwood case, in the context that it defined supplemental claim in the same way as Goldberg defined supplemental claim. But as I indicated before, Ironwood is factually distinguishable because it was analyzing the ability to proceed with appraisal because the insured had submitted a supplemental claim, where in this case, there's the complete absence of that. So the interpretation of the provision, whether it's by virtue of supplemental claim or reopen claim is an obligation the insured had, did not comply with under the duties after loss, was required to comply with under the legal action against us provision and supports the, the trial court's entry of summary judgment in favor of 
Church Mutual. So for those reasons, unless your honors have any additional questions, we rest on our briefs and we request the court affirm the motions for summary judgment. 19 minutes, you have one minute to spare. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you have four and a half minutes. May it please the court. I wanna focus on two things in rebuttal. The, the first point is about what notice was required under the policy prior to filing suit. And there was two separate affirmative defenses raised. The first was that a supplemental claim was not filed, right? That notice of a supplemental claim wasn't filed. That's paragraph 28 of the answer. And the second one was under paragraph 40. What Judge Sleep mentioned earlier was the duties under, under after loss under the policy to go out and, 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 and get additional estimates or submit those. Two separate defenses. The motion for summary judgment, the first one was denied and the second one was granted as to whether a supplemental claim was filed was solely based on the supplemental claim provision of the policy and whether the damages sought in this lawsuit were a supplemental claim or a part of the initial claim. And there, Ironwood and Veranda are particularly persuasive because in both of those cases, you had an insured submit a claim for roof damages. That was the initial claim. The carrier adjusted the claim and they reached a decision. And then a supplemental claim was filed for windows and doors. And that was the claim that this court said was a supplemental claim because it was items of damage not included in the initial claim. And it makes sense. The insurance company should have an opportunity to review and identify those items of damage before it's hauled into court to- but the definition of supplemental claim also includes items previously adjusted. It's the, a little more broad than what the argument is. And also your policy includes the open claim. So if you notify an insurance company like they did in every other case, but not here, if you notify an insurance client, a company of something subsequent that you dispute, that's a supplemental claim, whether it's been previously adjusted or not. Ironwood is very clear because the roof uh, is, is not in dispute. It's the windows and doors that he did not give them an opportunity to adjust. What they're arguing here is, you sued them for $2.6 million after they paid you, but all it's very little money because of the deductible. But you never gave them anything whatsoever to put them on notice and give them an opportunity to even adjust it and look at it, even talk about it. Respect, Your Honor, that's where we would turn this court's attention to Mr. Koch's affidavit. In that, Which is full of hearsay and later. That's what I asked you first. His affidavit is based on experts' conclusions that were given after you filed suit. These weren't expert opinions given in September 2017 or even the year 2017 or even the year 2018. This is after you filed suit. He, he has, does address so those. there's no evidence. He knew the extent of the damage of the roof at the time he was talking to the CMIC reps. Potentially, Your Honor, but not the full extent, but he did know that the repainting of the event center building, that roof was not going to be sufficient. No, and, and that, that was why he continually requests for a structural engineer to come inspect the property. He told them, he said, I disagree with your coverage analysis in this case. And if, and if he was required under the policy or the church was required under the policy to submit a supplemental claim and an oral claim is sufficient, then he did that because there's not a burden on the insurer to go out and adjust the loss themselves just in order to submit a supplemental claim. If that was the case, then, then no insured would be able to submit a claim because they'd have to go out and hire engineers and roofers and, and quantify all of the damage first. Just, just to open the claim process. And that's not what the policy provides. And that's not what, what Florida law says. He disagreed because he was physically in the building when Hurricane Irma struck. And he knew that, that he didn't know the, the full extent of the damage. He didn't know all the work that would have to be done. But he knew that because he saw you know, pieces of the roof coming off, repainting well, wasn't- did the care. And nobody brought it to tell him before they were sued. And Mr. Koch's point is that they never came out and, and re-inspected again. They never did any follow-up. They never, they never uh, uh, readjusted the claims decision. They said, this That's is our final payment. That was never filed either. 
set them up for bad faith because the, the gravamen of this whole lawsuit is improper, insufficient adjusted. They potentially they could have done a, a CRN, Your Honor, but the church had every right under the policy to say, you made initial claims decision and it's not insulated from judicial review just because you have another provision in the policy that talks about supplemental claims. And if they did, he said, that's insufficient. You need to pay more money. What you did initially was insufficient to satisfy your obligations to adjust this loss. And, and Judge Morris, what, what you mentioned is that this does turn into a forfeiture of coverage and that the, the cases in Curtis and Skeen had nothing to do with the neutral evaluation statute. The, the, uh, the case in Skeen, uh, or excuse me, Curtis was specifically about a, an insurer that filed the suit prematurely and the court said the, the, the 90 days to file the claim ran from the date the claim was filed, not the date that the sworn proof of loss was submitted. But even if it was, the, uh, the, the correct result is abatement, not, not forfeiture of policy benefits, not final judgment in favor of the insurance company. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry about that. I always can't tell I'm lawyers are out of time, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you.